Well, today's devoted disciple is not a joyful story, really. It's a sad story of Judas. Remember, he was a devoted disciple. And by that I mean, if you remember, that a devoted disciple would have a faith in Jesus that wasn't just intellectual but was relational, that there was a commitment to learn all your life as much as you could from the Master, the Lord Jesus, that there would be a surrender to the Holy Spirit in the rhythm of life so that the Spirit can shape the character of Jesus within us and that we invest our lives to build the kingdom. Now Judas was a devoted disciple. He, I believe, had all four of those qualities, all four of those characteristics, but he jumped rail at some point. So the story itself points to the necessity of Jesus himself to go to the cross. In an ironic way, Judas' story points out the need for forgiving grace that Jesus would say, if I be lifted up, I draw all people to myself. So we need to hear this story about Judas. My earpiece doesn't want to stay there. I don't think my ear changed. I'm not sure what's going on. Did you hear about the uh, tourist who was at the ocean and he came to an ocean pier that went way out into the ocean? And as he went down that pier, he was looking out over the water and eventually he looked down and he saw the waters kind of moving and dark underneath him and all of a sudden he had this kind of weird sensation of fear like whoa what if I fall in and he noticed there was a man standing on the pier and so he said to the man fishing if I fall into the waters will I drown the guy looked and said nah it's not falling into the water that causes you to drown it's if you stay under the surface that causes you to drown. That's Judas. It isn't falling into sin that causes us to drown. It's staying in the sin that can cause us to drown. You know anybody that has a baby and says, I'm going to call our boy Judas. It's not a name through history the people think is an endearing name. The reputation of the name of Judas is not unlike saying Adolf Hitler or Benedict Arnold or Jack the Ripper or Jeffrey Dahmer. There's something about the name itself that evokes this, um, this negative reaction within the spirit because Judas betrayed Jesus. But I come back to the amazing truth that Judas started out as a devoted disciple. He had the privilege of walking with Jesus in the flesh 24-7. Think of it. For three years, he was in the presence of Christ. Have you ever thought to yourself, well, it would all be clear to me if I could have just been one of those original disciples. I would have been faithful. I'd get it all. I would have never done what Peter did or Judas did. But Judas was with Jesus for three years. Think about it. He heard every sermon or message teaching about the kingdom of God that Jesus spoke. He was an eyewitness to every miracle that Jesus did. More than that, he was an apostle. When Jesus sent the twelve out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to preach and to cast out demons and heal the sick. Judas was there. When Jesus sent out the 70, Judas was among them. He was a very committed man, a highly religious man. But I believe that Judas never loved Jesus. Or if he loved Jesus, he loved himself more. And that
that was to stop. You know, when a prosecuting attorney is going to try a case, the prosecuting attorney always has to deal with motive along with action. So why do you do it? Why did Jesus betray Jesus? Some would say he actually was a hero. I remember when I was a young lad, remember, how many of you are old enough to remember Jesus Christ Superstar? That musical depicted Judas as a well-intended hero who tried to save Jesus from his self-destructive ways. And he was a hero, but he ultimately, though he tried, he couldn't save him. Some people speculate that Judas became disillusioned with Jesus because of his passivity. Judas had wanted, actually, that Jesus would use his power as Messiah to overthrow the political oppression of Rome. So some speculate that Judas betrayed Jesus because he'd seen the miracles and he thought, well, if I put Jesus in that position, he'll be forced to flex his muscles and use his power to overthrow the authority and we'll all be better for it. I think actually Judas was not a well-intended man. I think Judas was self-absorbed. He was a liar. He associated with Jesus only this rising popular rabbi. He was associating with him so that he could, in that position of close proximity, benefit from his power and population, maybe even his wealth. Remember, he was a keeper of the purse. So maybe instead of saying he was a liar, maybe we'd say Judas lived a lie. That there was pretension in everything that he did related to Jesus. All the while with an eye on money. Judas was a thief. As David read from the Gospel in Matthew's account about the woman that anointed Jesus' feet, it's also in John chapter 12. And in Matthew, it says the disciples protested. But in John 12, 6, it says, After that woman poured that costly perfume ointment over Jesus' feet and washed his feet with her tears and her hair, wiped them. But it was Judas that said, Hey, that's a year's worth of wages. Couldn't we have given that money to the poor? But it says in John's Gospel, Judas had no concern for the poor, but he was a thief, the holder of the money box. Think about a man who would not only steal, but who would steal from the friends of his, or would steal from Jesus. No scruple, no conscience. But ultimately, Judas was a betrayer. Can you imagine if this morning, by the way, normally I tolerate uh, no sleeping during my sermon. But today, you know, you lost an hour. If you're dozing, okay. But imagine if the police came to your house or to the place where you live and kicked in the door while you were still sleeping, came into your bedroom, and with the police is your best friend who points at you and says, yep, that's the one who did it. That's the one. And before the police lead you away, your best friend hugs you and says, take him away, be careful. Betrayal. A violation of trust. A violation of feigned love. A manipulation of your friends for self-gain. It says Judas kissed Jesus. Do you know that the actual word says it, he kissed him fervently? It wasn't just a peck on the cheek. He kissed him like, hmm, you're my friend. Take him away. The blackest form of hypocrisy. So 
what's our takeaway from this story? First, the profession of loyalty and faithfulness is really meaningless unless we, in faith, actually follow and obey Jesus with our life. All of us sitting here would probably say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But the profession of loyalty is really only real when our life every day is committed to following and lives in conscious, surrendered obedience to Jesus Christ. The second is pretty alarming. But this is the whole reason why I'm sharing Judas as a devoted disciple with you. I could become you. I could become Judas. So guard your heart. Stay close to God's people. Stay in the word. Continue to pray. Surround yourself with a circle of people who will call you out if you wander, if you do the foolish. Someone who will say, I'm really concerned because I don't like what I see. Someone who loves you enough to speak that truth in a way that begs you to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. I could become someone who begins to rationalize my sin and in my rationalization rebel against the one who I say is my Savior. Third, the takeaway would be that guilt and shame can and does often drive a person to despair and unbelief. Remember, it's not falling into sin that dooms you. It's staying under the grip of sin that is the problem. Fourth, Satan lies to us all. He says, it's too late. You're too far into this problem. You've become terrible. You're repulsive to God. You're worthless. Let's just give it up. It's all a lie. Because with Jesus, when there's hope, there's life. And when there's life, there's still hope. Hope, in fact, brings us to new life. And tomorrow does not have to be the perpetuation of of yesterday's failure. Let me say that again. Tomorrow does not, in the name of Jesus, who forgives our sin and fills us with his spirit and opens us to a new beginning, tomorrow does not have to be a continuation of yesterday's failure. In the name of Jesus, he makes us new. So what's the difference between Peter and Judas? They both betrayed Jesus, Peter denied him three times in public betrayal. It also says, though, in Matthew 27, Judas was crushed by his act of betrayal. It says of Judas, when he saw that Jesus actually ended up condemned, Judas changed his mind, brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I've sinned, Judas said. I betrayed innocent blood. And he threw the money at the religious leaders. And then it says he went out and earned it himself. What's the difference between Peter and Judas? I think the answer is in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Here's what it says. Godly grief produces a repentance that leads us back to salvation. But worldly grief only leads us to death. Judas did experience regret. He experienced a form of worldly grief. He was sorry, but it never changed his heart. He never turned to Jesus in his sadness and regret. In fact, it became despair. 
Peter, however, not only regretted what he had done, he regretted who he had become. And in his remorse and in his grief, he turned to Jesus. And Peter then became the one that Jesus built the church on. Our sins do not surprise the Lord Jesus. It's not falling into sin that dooms us. It's staying in a state of rebellious defiance that refuses to come back to faith. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This phenomenon is something that psychologists would call cognitive dissonance. Say that with me so it registers in your brain. Cognitive dissonance. Say it one more time. Cognitive dissonance. What does that mean? It means that when I sin as a believer, I have a battle that goes on in my thought process. That what I do is in conflict with what I believe. And I can't hold them both together. Either I will continue the behavior and change my values and my faith, or I will let go of the values and faith, perpetuate the behavior, and change whether I call it sin or not. I find a rationalization. It's not falling into sin that dooms us. It's staying in the grip of sin that dooms us. The last thing I want to say is Jesus was not a victim. Did you notice as Dave read the gospel, Jesus is so calm. Even when one of his disciples betrays him. Do you know that it actually says in the gospel leading up to that in Matthew 26, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying and his disciples all fell asleep, he, he comes from his last session of prayer, and he says to the disciples, it's time to leave. The betrayer is coming. Jesus was not surprised by Judas's betrayal, nor by the soldiers coming to arrest him. He also said with total calmness, why are you coming with the swords and clubs? Was I in rebellion publicly? Don't you know I could just say a word to my father, and he'd send 12 legions of angels to make sure I didn't have to die. I remember that old gospel song, maybe some of you too. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He didn't do that. Jesus was not a victim of a rogue disciple. Jesus was not a victim of Judas triggering the first domino that set in motion an accidental sequence of events that ended up leading him to die accidentally, though no one intended it. Jesus was not a victim of a mob rule decision. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down in my own accord. And then I come back to this verse. If I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. So why would I stay in a posture or a pattern of behavior that defies the God who not only created me, but the Jesus who went to the cross to sacrifice his life for me? Why would I perpetuate an attitude of shaking my fist at the heavens to a God who says, I love you, child. You're going to destroy yourself by your rebellion. Jesus was not a victim. 30 pieces of silver was the price of a slave. He became a willing slave obeying the will of his Father. He became my slave, your slave, our servant to give his life so that even in my most foolish and dark moments, I could still hear the voice of Jesus Christ say, come back to me. Come back to me. That's the whole reason 